This weekend is Jerusalem Day in Israel. As Shabbat closes, celebrations will begin. Israel is also heading to its second elections of 2019. It's too early to tell exactly what will come of this, but as events are moving at an alarming pace today, we expect it could well bring something interesting. Things we might watch for is the bringing about of a peace in Israel that the world might say is unjust. Maybe dealing with the Palestinian problem in a frowned-upon way, such as incentivized immigration, annexation of Judea and Samaria, that kind of thing. We know from the prophecies of the Bible that the establishment of peace in Israel will happen right before Armageddon, and it seems to even be a trigger for Armageddon to happen. You can think of events in the world today a bit like when Israel was marching around Jericho. They marched around one time every day until the last day, the seventh day, and they marched around the walls seven times. Events picked up the pace at the end. If we go back in history for a minute, as we think about Jerusalem and Jerusalem Day and the conflict that is brewing, on May 14, 1948, the state of Israel was declared without Jerusalem in Israel's control, following the partition vote of the UN on November 29, 1948. After the UN vote, attacks from the Palestinian Arabs began, and after the state was declared, a ring of Arab nations declared war, war calling to push the Jews into the sea. Jerusalem was divided and stayed that way until after 1967. During the war, Jews were ethnically cleansed from the Jordanian eastern side. Above is a before and after of the Jewish quarter. You can see the rampant destruction that they had suffered. Almost two decades, decades later, in 1967, Israel was attacked by Jordan after begging them to not enter the war. The resulting battles left Jerusalem and the Temple Mount in Israel's hands. Here's a picture of paratroopers with Rabbi Shlomo Gorin at the western wall of the Temple Mount, June 1967, shortly after they had liberated it from the Jordanian armies. Today, the conflict has many fronts. One of them is, strangely enough, archaeological. If it can be shown that the Bible is historically inaccurate, and discoveries that prove it can be hidden, it bolsters the positions of the liberal left and the Palestinians. The Palestinians claim that there never was a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount. Because it proves the historical accuracy of the Bible, Jerusalem archaeology is undermined on every side to try not to prove the Bible or that Israel belongs in her land. Part of this attack was carried out at UNESCO. Here's a part of the resolution that was passed. It says, UNESCO deeply deplores the failure of Israel, the occupying power, to cease the persistent excavations and works in East Jerusalem, particularly in and around the Old City, and reiterates its request to Israel, the occupying power, to prohibit all such works in conformity with its obligations under the provisions of the relevant UNESCO conventions, resolutions, and decisions. This was in 2016, and that is a section from a resolution that was passed that is widely considered to deny connection between the Temple Mount and Judaism. The Jerusalem Post says UNESCO votes no connection between Temple Mount and Judaism. Times of Israel points out on Independence Day, UNESCO okays resolution denying Israeli claims to Jerusalem, and others see that this attack on the Jewish connection to Jerusalem also affects Christians as well. Although it doesn't explicitly say in the resolution that there is no connection, because of the language that was used, it's widely seen as a denial of that connection, using consistently Arab terms for the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, and other things. It's also interesting that the Palestinians saw this as a denial of Israel's connection to their most holy site as well. Al Jazeera says, in 2016, UNESCO voted on a resolution which denied any Jewish connection to Jerusalem's al Aska Mosque and al Barak Western Wall. The proposal was put forth by a collection of MENA states and passed by a 24-member state majority. The resolution recognized the sanctity of the wider city of Jerusalem to the three Arab Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but stressed that the al Aska Mosque and its courtyards are only sacred to Muslims. This was from the Palestine Chronicle. This clearly flies in the face of all facts that can be observed. 
In his book, The Quest for Historical Israel, the author Israel Finkelstein from the Tel Aviv University boldly claims that archaeology is one of the only real-time witnesses to events described in the biblical text, particularly to those relating to the formative phases of early Israelite history. The interesting thing about this is that the Tel Aviv University and this individual, Israel Finkelstein, are notorious for denying the connection of various things to the Bible, various archaeological finds. So for him to admit that this is actually the case is quite significant. One such find that has been made that's very difficult to deny or naysay is the House of David inscription. Because of this find, the debate has has traveled on from being about, was there a King David at all, but rather, how great of a power was his kingdom? This is empirical evidence of one of the most prominent Bible characters, and it's written by Haziel, king of Syria. It reads as follows, My father went up, and then there's some missing, he fought at, and some more missing, and my father lay down, he went to his ancestors, and the king of Israel entered previously in my father's land. Hadad made me king, and Hadad went in front of me, and I departed from the sevens of my kingdom, and I slew seventy kings who harnessed thousands of chariots and thousands of horsemen or horses. I killed Joram son of Ahab, king of Israel, and I killed Ahaz, Ahaziahu, son of Jehoram, king of the house of David. That is the very significant line, because if there was a house of David, clearly there must have been an original David. And so it goes on. This is interesting for two reasons. One is because of the mention of the house of David, and also it shows the accuracy of the biblical record. Here's a quote from 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 10. It says, And Elisha said unto him, says Haziel, Go and say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And Haziel said, Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and the young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. So this was stated before the event, and then we find this record by Haziel of the attacks that he made in this very manner. There's also some very interesting things that have been found in the City of David excavations recently. This area is just adjacent to the Temple Mount, and it's outside of what are widely considered the old city walls. This is the old, old city, the original city of David. One of the things that they have discovered, very interestingly, is the ascent to the temple that went down from the Pool of Siloam in the south of Jerusalem up to the temple in the north. If we flip back to our previous little picture here, the yellow dot furthest to the bottom of the picture is where the Pool of Siloam was, And at the very top, extending off the top of the picture, is where the Temple Mount is. So people would purify themselves in the Pool of Siloam at the bottom and need to make their way up to the Temple at the other end of Jerusalem. To do so, they would walk up this stone stair path going from the lower pool up until the heights of the Temple Mount. So they've been excavating this, and they've been excavating excavating both the actual path itself, and they've also been digging in the drainage channel that goes underneath. And as people walked on the stairs, things might fall down through the passageways into the drainage channel below. This, of course, is the way that Jesus would have gone up, as well as everybody else, into the temple. It says in John 7 and verse 14, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. One of the things that have been found in that drainage channel underneath is this small golden bell. If you shake it, it makes bell-like tinkling sound. And one possible previous use 
of this bell was the high priest's garments. This, of course, is a, a spot that the high priest would be walking on to ascend up to the temple to do his service. In Exodus 28, verse 33 and verse 34, it says, And beneath upon the hem of it, that's of the high priest's garment, there shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. So here we have evidence for the high priest walking up this way and losing one of his bells in the drainage channel underneath. There was another similarly sized little find, and it was this little stone marble-looking thing. And it says on it in Hebrew, Becca. And we can read about it in Exodus chapter 38, verses 25 and 26. It says, And the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was an hundred talents, and a thousand seven hundred and threescore and fifteen shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, a becca for every man, that is, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. So the half a shekel was also called a becca, for every one that went up to be numbered from twenty years old and upward. So this little becca then was the weight of a half a shekel. As time went on, there were coins made that weighed exactly half a shekel for this purpose. So this is the half shekel. And what the archaeologists did is they got a scale, and they put on the one side the becca, and on the other side the half shekel coin. And they weighed exactly the same, confirming that they had indeed correctly assessed the use of this coin and the becca weight. Here's a closer look of the half shekel silver coin. It's an example that's in not particularly good condition. But based on this and other coins that they have found that are the same, they know the one side says Holy Jerusalem and the other side says half shekel. So from this, we know that not only was there a temple in Jerusalem, we know that they spoke Hebrew at it. We know that they had a half a shekel weight and a half shekel coins, and they walked on this very path to go up to the temple to use them. We also know that Jerusalem was considered holy at that time as well. These are two, also, two very interesting finds they also found. It's the bullae of Hezekiah and Isaiah. They were found in the same room, just nearly approximately three meters apart. And those two men are mentioned together in the Bible a number of times in the same verse, Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah. So once again, the Bible is confirmed that there was actually a Hezekiah and an Isaiah the prophet who were working together in Jerusalem before its destruction. Another thing that emphasizes the Jewish connection to Jerusalem is this trumpeting stone. This is one of the stones that was part of the outside wall on the Temple Mount where somebody would stand to blow the trumpet. And it says on the stone in Hebrew, the place of trumpeting. This is the place that the Sabbath would have been announced from, and the blasts are detailed in the Talmud. Various alarms and calling of assembly are also mentioned in the Bible. And this is great evidence for both the Bible and Jewish presence on the Temple Mount. It can also be read by modern Hebrew speakers who would understand its significance. This is evidence of the restoration of the people, language, and customs in Jerusalem. Numbers 10, 2-4 says, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly, and for the journeying of the camps. And so it goes on. So it was necessary for them to have a prominent place where everybody could hear the trumpet being blown. And where, of course, would that be in Jerusalem? At the top of the side of the temple, where everybody would be able to see and hear. There are many other interesting and significant finds that we don't have, to t have the time to go into today. One last one that we will just mention is there was two little scrolls or amulets that were found near Jerusalem. They were in a burial cave between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. They are small silver scrolls about the size of a cigarette butt, and they're engraved with biblical text. The second of them says, there's some parts that are broken at the beginning, and then it says, the great, part missing, who keeps covenant and graciousness towards those who love him and those who keep his commandments, the eternal, Part missing again, blessing more than any snare and more than evil, for redemption is in him, for Yahweh is our restorer and rock, 
May Yahweh bless you and may he keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you. And it's broken as it carries on. That end, of course, is the, the priestly blessing that's mentioned in the Bible. But what this is, is it's a prophecy. It's a prophecy that's coming true, coming true today as it was discovered. God is keeping his covenant. He is restoring his people and redeeming them. And UNESCO and any others that would like to cannot stop the restoration and redemption of Israel that's coming to pass before our very eyes. This has been Tim Billington with you in another edition of The Bible in the News. Please join us again next week for another edition, God willing. 